that should have all that power. The clock is ticking, I just count the hours. Stop tripping, I'm tripping off the power. Welcome back, young scholars. In this video, we will be discussing the Enlightenment. The big question we should be able to answer after watching this video is, how did the Enlightenment change people's ideas about the form and functions of government? So a quick little review of the history of government up to this point in world history. The vast majority of governments that we've studied have been monarchies ruled by a single ruler, be it an emperor or a king, with a few exceptions. And we talked about direct democracy in Athens in the classical age. We talked about in the early phases of the Rome. We talked about the Roman Republic. But most of the governments that we've seen, like the pharaohs of Egypt or the emperors in China or Louis the Sixteenth during monarchies. In terms of where the ruler gets their power, how do they legitimize their power? God. Rulers up to this point have mainly asserted the right to rule based upon power given to them by God. In Europe, we refer to this as the divine right of kings. In China, we've been calling this the mandate of heaven. In period four, rulers are increasingly consolidating their power. Sometimes this period is known as the age of absolutism. So whether it's those European kings or whether it's czars in Russia or the shogun in Japan, we've seen those rulers starting to consolidate and concentrate power in their hands. Now, the problem with concentrated power, consolidated power, or absolute power, is that absolute power corrupts absolutely, is the famous saying. Absolute power leads to tyranny. But during the Middle Ages, there was an attempt to limit the ruler's power. And you, you may recall King John of England um, was forced by the noble lords, who were really not happy with King John, to sign a document called the Magna Carta. And it really was the first successful attempt to identify, well, what are some of the limits to the king's power? And what rights do we have that would, that would stop the king from engaging in an arbitrary application of the law? So in period four, there's a major intellectual movement known as the Enlightenment. And this is going to last from the 1600s to the 1700s. And it's going to apply science and reason to the study of government. In other words, with the scientific revolution taking place around the same time, there's this recognition that in the same way that maybe we can find natural laws that exist in, in nature, like gravity or Newton's laws of motion, that maybe there are some kind of mathematical or scientific principles that also apply to the way in which societies have decided to come together and form and ultimately decide on how decisions should be made and how power should be allocated. Now, our founding fathers were very interested in studying these Enlightenment thinkers, and a lot of the ideas of these Enlightenment thinkers are going to make their way into the system that the founding fathers eventually craft. So some of the Enlightenment thinkers that you need to be familiar with are Thomas Hobbes, John Locke, Baron de Montesquieu, and Mary Wollstonecraft. So let's talk about Thomas Hobbes first. Not this Hobbes, but this Hobbes. So Thomas Hobbes was a British Enlightenment thinker. He's going to develop a concept known as the state of nature. And what the state of nature is, is this sort of hypothetical condition where human beings live where there's no government, there's no laws, there's no way to enforce the government, there's no police, uh, there's no military to back up, up anything. And in this kind of state, Thomas Hobbes theorized, leads to anarchy very quickly. Why? Because as Thomas Hobbes kind of believed, human beings by nature are bad people, right? We're kind of evil, greedy people. So for instance, like the kids in the Lord of the Flies who get stranded on the island without any parents, without any authority, very quickly it turns into, all right, how do I steal from each other? How do, how do I figure out ways to hurt one another? And so the state of nature is this hypothetical condition in which people live prior to government. And this is really the major contribution of Thomas Hobbes. 
Now, Hobbes again believed that in the state of nature, life of man is nasty, brutish, and short. Now, he believed that the most effective form of government was in fact a monarchy, but was one that was where the role of monarch was held by someone who was benevolent, right? Who thought about the interest of the people rather than simply the interest of themselves. That's the most efficient, in Thomas Hobbes' mind, and effective form of government. Now, the next major Enlightenment thinker was John Locke. He also was a Englishman. He is going to start with the same premise as Thomas Hobbes, that the state of nature is the starting point of this mental exercise. But he believed that people will leave the state of nature to ultimately protect their natural rights. In other words, they'll form agreements with one another. And he described these as social contracts, where they come together and they form governments to ultimately protect their natural rights. So for example, we do this all the time in, in classrooms. We form maybe rules or contracts together, or we could, where we said things like, we the class agree to the following rules for our society. Imagine again, there's no rules in our classroom at all. We might agree to some provisions like, well, no killing another except in self-defense, no stealing from each other, no slavery. That seems unjust and unfair. But ultimately, we have to identify all right, well, who's going to be responsible for enforcing those laws. Who should have that power and authority within our society once we've crafted these laws? And then everyone has to give their consent to it. They have to sign off on it. That's the critical step that John Locke identified. He said a government's authority comes from the people's consent to be bound by the laws of government. And once you've recognized this, that's a critical transition because no longer is power coming from where? From God. Now instead, people, power is coming from the people's consent to be bound by the laws and rules that they've all collectively agreed to. Now, stop and ask yourself, is this a more effective way or a more logical or rational way of organizing government? Yes, because people are less likely to be upset at the condition that they're in or the government that they're in the laws that they have to follow when they've had some ownership or stake in the crafting that government rather than in the context of like divine right to rule people will just say well wait a second that seems very arbitrary that that person is the king and they're just making these arbitrary decisions so this is the concept of the consent of the governed now we did something very similar in our society when we created our constitution and we spelled out well this is for we the people uh, in order to form a more perfect union, have created this constitution. And that ultimately is what provides power in our form of government, is the consent that the people have. Now you'd say, well, he's like, I didn't sign the constitution when I was born. Well, there's implied consent in our country, right? That if you don't want to be part of this government experiment, then, then you need to move to another country. John Locke said that it's government's job to protect people's natural rights. And he really identified three natural rights that the government needs to protect. One, life two, liberty, and three, property. So that essentially is the code to the lock that is John Locke, is life, liberty, and property. Sometimes these interests come in conflict with one another. So for example, on the issue of abortion, those people who are pro-life say that at the moment of conception, that fetus has a life interest, right? That the government has a job of protecting. Well, for women who are pro-choice, they say that interest is not as, as powerful as my liberty interest in making decisions with respect to my own body and with respect to my own health. Another time that, that these interests come in conflict with one another was around the issue of slavery. So for example, the slaves would assert, well, I have an interest in my own liberty, my own freedom. That liberty is really the antithesis of slavery. Whereas the slave owners would say, well, hold up. You are my property slave, and therefore I have a property interest. John Locke also said that it is the right of the people, if the government is not doing its job of protecting their natural rights, to have a revolution. So the right of revolution, when a government fails at its job, the people have the right to overthrow the government and form a new government. And this should sound familiar to you. If you read carefully the document that is our Declaration of Independence, it very clearly spells out this is government's job to protect, Thomas Jefferson said, our inalienable rights to life, liberty, and he said the pursuit of happiness, and that it's the people's right to have a revolution when the government, in this case, they were asserting that the King of England, King George, had failed at his job of 
protecting the colonists' natural rights. So a third Enlightenment thinker is Baron de Montesquieu. He's a French Enlightenment thinker. Here's a quote from Montesquieu. Constant experience shows us that every man invested with power is apt to abuse it and to carry his authority as far as it will go. When legislative power is united with executive power in a single person, a monarch, there is no liberty, because one can fear that the same monarch that makes the tyrannical laws will execute them tyrannically. So, what is the solution here when we have, again, concentrated power within one person and we're fearful of tyranny and abuse of power? What's the solution? Montesquieu said, well, a simple solution is just to separate those powers, right? Take the powers to legislate or make the laws and make them distinct from the powers to enforce or execute those laws. And then you could also have a separate power to interpret the laws to decide whether or not there's been any violation. So he believed the power of government should be separated, separation of powers, which is something that our founding fathers adopted for our constitution. Fourth Enlightenment thinker is Mary Wollstonecraft. Now she is going to advocate for equal rights for women. She's not going to be <laughs> knocking down the door saying women should be given the right to vote and, and women should be allowed to run for office. Instead, she asks for something pretty simple. She asks that women and men be educated on equal standing. And the justification she gives for this is that women, in order to fulfill their roles as mothers, have to be able to provide a good education for their children, especially their male sons who need to grow up to be good citizens in a way that essentially is taking a little chisel to what is has been this institution of patriarchy in this class. It's not a big hammer, but instead she's just cracking the door open and saying, well, women really should have access to education. But as we know, education is power. And so this is going to get the ball rolling on a movement towards greater equality for women. So the big question you should be able to answer after watching this video is how did the Enlightenment change people's ideas about the form and functions of government? Thanks for watching. God Rulers up to this point have mainly asserted the right to rule based upon power given to them by God. In Europe, we refer to this as the divine right of kings. In China, Welcome back, young scholars. In this video, we will be discussing the Enlightenment. The big question we should be able to answer after watching this video is, how did the Enlightenment change people's ideas about the form and functions of government? So a quick little review of the history of government up to this point in world history. The Republic, but most of the governments that we've seen, like the pharaohs of Egypt, or the emperors in China, or Louis XVI, or in monarchies, in terms of where the ruler gets their power, how do they legitimize their power? The vast majority of governments that we've studied have been monarchies ruled by a single ruler, be it an emperor or a king, with a few exceptions. And we talked about direct democracy in Athens in the classical age. We talked about in the early phases of Rome. We talked about the Roman.